This fan base is amazing. The city of Cincinnati is amazing, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Desmond takes a handoff run to the right. He's got all sorts of room to the 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Howdy, folks. Welcome back to Viva La Cats, the Cincinnati podcast represent, representing the 1012 Network. I am your host, Justin Howes, accompanied by my great friend, Steve Maurer, and we are here to bring you the very best of the Bearcats every single week in our episode. Oh, God. I'm going to start over. Sorry. <laughs> it's already messed up. No, no, no. Keep it in. Let's just let's just keep it rolling. That's that's exactly what our red zone offense did on Saturday night, Justin. Uh... Getting right to the end and then Peter out right there. Yeah, yeah, that. Uh, so check out our spaces <laughs> after games. And yeah, uh, speaking of poor. I feel like finishing. that intro was just fitting for what what the Bearcats did on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Let's just get into it. The honeymoon phase is over, folks. Um, if if you were on the Scott Satterfield bandwagon, you've probably come back down to earth now. Uh, if you weren't, you're probably angry. Um and if you were skeptical, you're probably just still very skeptical. Um, I don't think anything can be blamed on any one thing, but um, the loss of this game can absolutely be blamed on a poor red zone offense. Um, Bearcats, unfortunately, break the streak at 16. Well, the Red Hawks broke the streak for the Bearcats at 16 games. Um, will not go to the 17th, and here we are. I mean, this is the game that we all kind of looked at as uh, chalk it up to a win. Let's go on to Oklahoma. Um, and we've been saying that since schedule release uh, a few months back. So I, I think now that we're looking at the position that we're in, um, you know, I I'm trying to figure out what to take away from this game because clearly there were some flaws. Um, I, I want to give a lot of credit to Miami because they deserve it. Like they deserve the credit for this game because I think the I think the Bearcats gave them a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, Miami held strong in the in the red zone. I mean, it, it takes defense to shut down offense, even if it's a bad offense, even if it's a bad red zone offense. It takes good defense to keep that consistently and shut down. Uh, what was it? Six red zone attempts that we did not score in out of the seven total. Um, so. That, I think, says a lot um, to hold us to at least a field goal in many of those situations. So, Steve, from your perspective, um, that was clearly the biggest issue. But what do you think uh, you can take away from this Miami game going forward? I've actually thought about this a lot, Justin, when I was come on the podcast to say for the millions and millions of listeners that are checking us out every week. Thanks for doing that, by the way. Thank you, millions of listeners. It stunk, Justin, plain and honest. It stunk. <laughs> Um, I think that I, and I feel like many people in our program would agree with me on these couple points I have here. One, I, th I feel like we have more talent than them and we, for the time being, as long as we're in the big 12 and keep going up, having, getting more money, we will still have more talent than them. Um, I do feel like that this is also a no win game for Cincinnati because no matter how well you play, either you will be thought of as you you could have played better or you didn't come win by enough or oh you just played a mac team especially as a big 12 team now not no longer an american team that is the merriam webster definition of a trap game <laughs> well and also uh this is not really a fine rivalry like i was listening to the home field podcast today where they were um uh, where they're interviewing tcu fans and they kind of had this felt the same way about smu where you know, people talk trash about them, but they're not really relevant in the area. Uh, well, the SMU fans talk trash about them. If there were any Miami fans, Justin, I am best friends with like a <laughs> Miami grad who cheers for the Bearcats die hard. And he was upset <laughs> when UC lost on Saturday night. That's just all you need to know about this rivalry. It, and it's not a rivalry. Like we used to just like kicking them down. And I mean, not to say that the games weren't close over the years. And obviously like I, I always felt like a, 
other than that 2021 game, we never really came into this game and really imposed our will. Maybe 2019 as well. But obviously right. that was the height of the program under Fickle. Um, the other years, we probably just never looked as good as we should have. And it finally came back to bite us in the ass. I mean, I guess credit to Miami, but I want to hold our program to a higher standard than that, Justin. And mm-hmm. it's you no, know, it's not just about one person. It's a team effort. Win as a team, lose as a team. And I'm a Bearcat fan, die hard. And I'll never, you know, talk trash about any coach, any player, because I know the people in that program. I know know they're hurting. I know they're going to just bounce back this week and be better than they were last week. But it just hurts, you know. It stinks. And I think, you know, I think most fans would agree with me on those points. And, you know, all we can do now, Justin, I think, again, listen to the spaces if you want some more in-depth reaction. But... All you can do now is just move forward and move ahead to Saturday. I mean, there's really no use uh, in talking about, you know, how much the loss sucks other than that. Like, Justin, I had four different people text me at the end of the game. I never have four (laughs) people text me at the end of of, like Bearcats games, man. It was like, I think, you know, obviously this is just something that it hurts for sure. And especially when you get used to beating someone and they beat you back, then it hurts even more. But you know, if it if this is what the wake up call that our guys needed to take away and really lock in for the rest of the season and the coaching staff, then I will take it because I'm gonna just say a take here. Like, if we hadn't have lost this game, do you care that we really won this game? Other than just ring, making bell jokes and ring doing the ring absolutely game? not. No, and I mean, go ahead, go ahead. I'll just make this comparison to Justin. I felt way worse about losing to Northern Kentucky last year in basketball. <laughs> like I, I, yeah. I definitely felt really bad about losing to Miami. Uh, but man, losing to NKU, like that, that's like almost an inexcusable loss. And I, I saw some basketball and football school comparisons on Saturday <laughs> and man, I mean, I think just the fan base was going through it, but yeah, Here's would... here, here's my last point, Justin, and I'll hand the ball back to you. It sucks. It and if we had won, people would have just, you know, gotten through it, said rivalry game and whatever. But I think you need the other team to win every now and then for it to be a rivalry. And I hate, I hate to say that because obviously, it's Miami. They don't have fans. They don't care about any other game except for this game. It just sucks. Yeah, I mean that. I think you make a good point there too about. <clears throat> there does need to be some back and forth. Um, And this is kind of one of those things where, like you mentioned the NKU point, I I would say I have to agree with that mainly because as as much as a football loss hurts um, and it almost feels like it hurts more because it carries more weight because of, you know, the playoff situation because of end of season bowl selection situation versus grand scheme of an entire like 30 game basketball season. Uh, you have you can make a couple more mistakes there. Um, here, I think now that we've had some time to cool off, I look at it as you won 16 straight. It takes an ungodly amount of luck to win 16 straight. It doesn't matter how much better your team is. It takes luck. Go back to 2017. This is the thing I keep harping on. Go back to 2017. Pick six wins that game. We should have lost that game. We did not play that game like we were going to win that game. It took a fourth quarter absolute like monster show to put on like an extra 14 points. We were down by like two scores going into that quarter. We should not have won that game. And yet we found a way to win that game. That streak should have been over six years ago. And here we are and now. And it's that would have going. been a better loss to swallow, honestly. Exactly. Too, you know? And it would have. Except and it's on the this. road. Yeah, and and it's on the road, and I I think that's the hard part. But when you look at the grand scheme of things, it's year one under a new coach. You have a lot of roster turnover. Some people brought up the how much the players care because you have a lot of transfers. That whole thing, I'm not going to entertain that. But I I really think that what this comes down to is a team finally got one over on somebody and your luck just kind of ran out. And yes, there's a lot of responsibility to be taken from the coaching staff, from the offense, from the defense, from, you know, whole nine yards. But I I think it really comes down to a team just finally got their luck and got one game over. And that's a crazy thing. It took them all of that effort. It took them damn near two decades to get one over on us in overtime with one of our with 
one of our worst performances execution wise on offense that we've seen in a long time. So take that with a grain of salt as much as it may be hard to. Um, and, and this is one of those things that I want to harp on now too. We all thought that we'd be going two and one going into this Oklahoma game. Is this the way that you thought it would go? Absolutely not. When you won against Pitt on the road, did that make you feel a hell of a lot better? And was 3-0 and anything other than 3-0 and after beating Pitt on the road acceptable? Absolutely not. But you thought, everybody else thought we were going to be 2-1 and going into that. And if you didn't, I'm 90% certain almost all of you thought we were going to lose to Pitt. So you go into this game, now 2-1. and The loss stings a lot because it's Miami and not Pitt. But you're in the same place you expected to be. And like you said, I think you make a good point. It's not necessarily a bad situation to lose a game before the biggest game of your year, because what that does is that punches you in the mouth. And not only that, the weight that this game carried against Miami, where it's like you're, you shouldn't lose and you need a wake up call. A real wake up call is losing a 16 straight streak. That wake up call, I think is going to give these guys a lot of juice and I don't think that that's a kind of game that derails your season, as many people are saying it does. I think this team has what it takes to play up to a speed of a, a team like Oklahoma. It's just whether or not they can execute four quarters, be clean all the way through, because you know if you give Oklahoma an inch, they're going to take a mile. So I think that the way I look at it, we're in the same place we thought we would be. And as much as that loss sucks, you should be content. You should be content. It's not that you should be, maybe you shouldn't be content. Don't look at it so negatively. Look at it as there is a way to come out of this and there is momentum going forward. Um, and so with all of that said, I did put out a confidence poll on Scott Satterfield because I was really curious. This is again, day after the game. I just wanted to see how people generally felt um, because Miami, it's a non-negotiable. You win that game. Um, you're supposed to. So after having a day to kind of cool off, what were people's thoughts on Scott Satterfield? Um, the majority, 39% of people said, chill out. We got nine games left. And I'm glad that most of the people understand that and get with that. Um, I think the other two biggest categories here, uh, if you beat OU coming back in, you're on board and some people lost their trust. And now they're going to have to be watching a little closer in some of these games and really probably micro analyzing Satterfield's game plan uh, going forward. But it seems to the most part, most people are going to be okay. And I think that that's really like, you just have to have your head level coming out of this. And I think that's the most important part. And that actually is yeah. one of our higher voted polls too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and again, I'll, I'll close this out with another basketball analogy. Like losing to Xavier, I, I'll rank the losses that I've talked about in this show. Anytime losing to Xavier hurts the most <laughs> for sure. Someone's going to clip this Miami, Xavier, Louisville, and all of our haters are going to clip this part. Uh, Justin, <laughs> but I definitely say Xavier losses hurt the most. That NKU loss hurt the second most because <laughs> I don't think we should ever lose to NKU. <laughs> And that Miami loss definitely hurt because I think we know we have a better, more talent than them. And we just wasted too many opportunities. It was a winnable game at home too. I think the at home part is the part that hurts. If we had lost on the road, maybe it would have been like brushed away a little bit. Like, Oh, you know, like we went into their place losing at home, man. Like, especially when you put out that tweet that was on the graphic, like uh, on the broadcast, man, like, we didn't do that too much when uh, Mr. Fickle was here. So <laughs> I just don't think people are used to it. And obviously, you know, it's not like we were going to go undefeated again in the Big 12. You you knew going in that there was just going to be some things that were going to be harder about being in the Big 12. And, you know, it just I, – I just feel like Satterfield is kind of in – he was in a rough spot and he redeemed himself a little bit, lost a little bit of it. He can earn it back this week in a big way. Mm -hmm. Or if they respond the rest of the season, Justin – Let's think about this real quick. You still got the rest of the Big 12 schedule ahead of you. And, yep. you know, if somehow you were like, I swear this Big 12 schedule looks better and better for the Bearcats every week, but it my does. faith <laughs> in their ability to do well against that schedule uh, got knocked down just a little bit by mm -hmm. that performance on Saturdays, especially at home. So, 
Justin, should we get into the mailbag a little bit? Ask ask the people what the concerns are. Yes, I have one final point actually because I remembered this. I was trying to remember what is Steve's spin zone for this show. Do you remember yeah. your spin zone? Because I'm I not going to steal your thunder Last because this is a great a, point. Tell them. Last time we Tell lost them, Miami, it was our first year in a power conference. We lost to them in 2005, first year in the Big East. Lost to them in uh, 2023, first year in the Big 12. Got some bigger fish to fry. Um, and then also, if we lose one and win the next 16, then I'm good with it, you know? 32 and two yeah. <laughs> over the last 34 matchups would be pretty nice. That's like Oklahoma against Oklahoma state levels. Yeah. Let's not forget. Uh, that was right. The year before Ben Ro- or year after Ben Roethlisberger is gone and think of where he is now. So that's a lot of time folks. Yeah. Let's get into the mailbag. So we ask just generally open comments, concerns, questions. What do you guys have? Um, We'll pull a few of these, but um, from Cincy H at Cincy Huffman, what is our theoretical identity under Coach Scott's, Scott Satterfield supposed to look like? Last night was a mess. Crowd was jacked, but so was the game plan. Um, I think we've seen a lot of our identity so far, personally. I mean, we have ran the ball real hard. We've had a pretty decent you know, uh, passing game showing. We've been able to compete there for sure um we'll see how we do against the rest of the big 12 but i mean i think it's a balanced approach i mean i think if you look at where we were with fickle it was very defense oriented scott satterfield because of how talented brian brown is and how this defensive scheme is with these players i I think we're supposed to be a very balanced approach team um and, and i don't think it necessarily favors one side of the ball or other that's what i would say steve well, uh, we are a rushing based attack, um, but weirdly enough, Justin, I did not see the option run at all on Saturday night, like with Aaron Turner that went for so many yards against Pitt that first drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, defense got a turn, got a couple turnovers on Saturday and just weren't able to really turn that into and many points. And I do think like if this is the flukiest worst game that the Bearcats play, I think they can play a lot better than that. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, I, I, so I think our identity is running the ball and having a great defensive line, but we just did not get really to the backfield much. Miami had a quick passing game. And if, you know, other schools take advantage of that quick passing game, that could be harmful for us. I think it's just, we got to know what our strengths are and try to cover cover our, our faults with our strengths. So I, I think there is some possibility that the Bearcats can do better at that and mm-hmm. maybe play better against better competition, whatever happening on Saturday. But I think that's some of the concerns is that if ball's coming out too quick and our defensive line is not able to get to the quarterback, then our our like secondary may not be able to stand up to some of these big 12 wide receiver rooms. It's a very good point. While we're on secondary, let's jump over to some of the other questions too, pertaining to the Bearcats specifically going into playing Oklahoma. Um, when we asked this open-ended question, what are your biggest concerns? What are your biggest questions? There was a handful of people who talked about the secondary. Um, and, and I think that that really is a big one. Um, big 12 enjoyer. Awesome. Awesome name there at clone seven, 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 one QB play in secondary. So far since he KD five, one, three, since he, the secondary being able to make plays against the Oklahoma pass game. I think that's really important. That's specifically against the Oklahoma passing game. I think it's going to be really critical. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute, but um, as well, the DBs got to make adjustments for the game or it'll be over after the first quarter as Nick Mullins, 15, uh, Daphne Coleman, prime DMC sings secondary. That's a lot of secondary talk. That's a lot of defense talk. I really do think that is the question of this game is because, you know, it, it's not like some of the games that you've had so far this year where it's just kind of, you know, question marks in general. How will the offense perform? How will the defense perform? We've got a good defense. We're trying to figure out offense. We now kind of know what we've got on both sides of the ball. The real question is playing against Oklahoma, they have a stout offense, an incredible offense. Perhaps some could say, some could argue they have the best offense in FBS this year. So we'll get into that a little bit more specifically. But on the Cincinnati secondary, Steve, I want you to kind of, you know, take this one. But I mean, I think I think the biggest question mark for me 
And I guess kind of the upside that I see in this is if there's any time for the secondary to show their true colors, it is in this game. We've seen some exposure throughout the season so far, but where we have the most opportunity is to show how we can compete against basically one of the best offenses in the country. And I think that if they can hold this team under 30 points, realistically, given how good Oklahoma's offense is, I think you should be satisfied with that. Now, are we going to get burned? Absolutely. It's going to happen once or twice, maybe a handful of times. But can they maintain a game speed that allows the offense to work? And can they let the offense get on the field? That's the biggest thing. And get, if they can create turnovers, that is really going to be key here, especially if we can get an interception, if we can get a fumble turnover, if we get something there, let that offense get on the field a little bit more often, I think is key here. Well, I think you got to get your hands up at the D line as well and like really try to block those passing lanes. And I understand, you know, Oklahoma is going to try and go down the field. I did watch a little bit of their game against Tulsa on Saturday. And, you know, they were, they just overmatched Tulsa and they just ran the run by the receiver play. But <laughs> I do think that Oklahoma and SMU, I'm sorry, SMU and Cincinnati may be a little bit close just from some graphs I've, I, I saw on Twitter. So very, <laughs> thorough analysis there but you know if the bearcats are able to do some of the things that smu did uh and you know obviously there was some controversy after that game for oklahoma so maybe their offensive coordinator's head was not fully in the game <laughs> yeah. um but you know if if cincinnati can at least look at what happened in that smu game because that's their only aberration right now oklahoma the other two games they made tulsa and arkansas state look like grease spots so like if they can take something from that SMU game and apply it to their game plan against Oklahoma, then maybe they'll make it, they'll keep it close. Spreads about 14, Justin. So, hey, 14 point dogs in Nippert. Yeah. I want to know this. So, spin yeah. zone for you. Yeah. We've, um, smiling through the pain. There's, there's a lot of people who bet on the Miami game. Um, and, this is the last mention of that game going forward for the entire rest of the season. Probably not. Um, just this might not be the year to bet on the Bearcats in any game. It's going to be a real roller coaster, and there's going to be lots of probably highs and lows still coming down the stream here. I don't know if I'd bet on the Bearcats. I would just enjoy the games, enjoy the wins, fight through the losses, but don't make your losses even worse. Oh, yeah, cats, baby. I guess, I guess. Hey there, folks. We just want to take a quick break to share this message from our friends over at Charlie Hustle Clothing Co. Now, these guys bring the heat all winter long. They give you many, many options for the fall football season, as well as going through the basketball season through winter. They're comfortable. They're cozy. They have plenty of vintage options for over 30 different schools, cover just about all of the Big 12. And there's a wide variety. So if you want to do some shopping for that cousin or aunt that you might not have something for, or maybe your grandpa needs a new Iowa State t-shirt or something like that, go check out charliehustle.com. That is www.charliehustle.com and use the promo code from our network, 1012. That is 101512, 101215 to get 15% off of all non-sale items from Charlie Hustle. And remember, if you want vintage and you want it fresh, you're going to get it from Charlie Hustle. Um, here's another one. Uh, our favorite frenemy, shout out Dolly. Uh, it's very fun on Twitter. Uh, at Dolly underscore drama. Can Dylan Gabriel win at Nippert? <sighs> of course, he's going to bring UCF feel into this. Him, man. But yeah, yeah I mean, got to feel good for him. <laughs> I'm really curious. I am. I'm honestly really curious because. <laughs> the offense is very functional for Oklahoma. Um, and whether you attribute that to Dylan Gabriel or whether you attribute to that to a just very talented system that he is just happens to be the uh, quarterback in, I, I think, you know, it shakes out to can Dylan Gabriel be the star in a game and win in a nipper? I, I think that's sort of the real question there. Personally, I don't know. I mean, the, their passing game is their money. And um, unless they want to like try to throw their not, not as great rushing game at the Bearcats, very good rushing defense. 
I think it's going to have to be on the shoulders of Dylan Gabriel here. And I think he is going to carry a lot of the weight in this game. Of course, Dylan Gabriel's experience in Cincinnati. Steve, tell us how that went. Um, uh, you may remember a certain number 12 running a ball <laughs> into the end zone uh, that night. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a weird year, honestly, for uh, UCF Cincinnati rivalry. Um, and that's probably feels good for Dolly to be able to uh, say that. Uh uh, now because uh, apparently Dylan Gabriel didn't leave UCF on the best terms. So I'm sure UCF fans were looking forward to potentially getting a crack at him. If UCF had come to Oklahoma as or Oklahoma had come to UCF this year, they, they will not, but you know, I mean, he didn't play that well in that 2019 game, but freshman probably didn't have as good of receivers as he does now. Yeah, I I don't really think you could take much into that game, obviously, because we had <laughs> Sauce Gardner and Kobe Bryant on the outside, too, for that game. And we were yeah. playing the three, three, five and we had Marcus Freeman. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> a little different circumstances there. But, you know, I, I do think maybe if they can, like, disrupt him early, get his timing off, maybe Oklahoma will consider bringing in their their backup star. I'm really not trying to get my hopes up too much for this Saturday just because like I don't like it's it's just going to be a t- tough hill to climb and you know if they just come out and score 21 quick points then we kind of know where we're at but right. I am interested to see how the defense can bounce back because they didn't you know obviously like we said quick passes and Miami was re- able to really take advantage of them not getting a crazy amount of pressure and not spying the quarterback either. I kind of want to wonder if uh, Gabriel is going to take that advantage as well when he can. But well, while you're on that, uh, so at Bearcat, Matt had also asked, uh, well, brought up a concern about defensive pressure on the QB, specifically on Oklahoma's QB. Um, and I think you're kind of already on that point. <laughs> Got to start paying attention there. I don't know how else to explain that. The, the amount of times that they allowed Gabbert to just get out into green was just dumbfounding to me. I was incredibly I surprised the previous week. Yeah. Like even with, yeah. So they, they've got to figure that out. Um, and I, I imagine they will, um, you know, maybe like, I don't think you would be saving anything for this game because, you know, you had to play pit in week two. So you probably left your cards on the table for that, but you know, it's just like, it's just a little bit, like it, I would have been so confident in this game. Maybe it's a little bit better that we lost and I'm not so confident in the Bearcats <laughs> ability in this game. And the fact that Pitt stinks um, makes me wonder if, you know, what that law, lo- that win is going to mean for mm-hmm. Cincinnati as we go down the stretch here. But, but, you know, I'm always Bearcat till I die. So I'm just going to be hoping that we can pull off the upset on Saturday, but just, well, it, it, it looks a little bit less likely. I'll say that. Speaking of upsets, uh, if we can pull it off, uh, I love this question or uh, from Nick Bauer at NR Bauer. Will the Bearcats be ranked after beating Oklahoma on national TV? I love the confidence just throwing that out there. I think if yeah. they beat them, they're going to jump. I don't know if they're going to jump all the way back to where they were. I really, really, really doubt it. Will FPI favor them? They might still weigh the Miami loss pretty heavily, but... I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think it puts us in the top 30. I don't question that. Does it put us on the outside looking in? Absolutely. Does it slot us into the top 25? I don't think so. It's a home win. It's a big 12 game. It's a team that was not very favored. Now has looked less. Uh, there's less daylight upon them, but. I still don't think it puts us into the top 25. I think it puts us right there, maybe 27, 28. There'll be a handful of votes because there was some good performances in week one, week two, week three, you let one get away from you. Um, But I don't know, beat Oklahoma at home. It's going to look pretty good, uh, especially on national TV. That will play some weight as well. Um, As you can see, anybody who plays on national television, on a Fox game like that clearly is getting the viewership this year. Uh, shout out Colorado. Um, damn 9.3 million viewers for that CSU Colorado game. That was kind of crazy. That's like a record for late night games. So it was going to like two 30 in the morning and you have 9 million viewers. That's honestly, it was got to move to the West coast. It was on at 1130 here. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I was still in bed at a good time. You know, so it was great. Justin, you want to get into some of these stats real quick? Yeah. So, 
Um, we're going to end off on our Oklahoma preview with this. Um, I pulled some quick stats out of curiosity. Um, so this is just going to be talking mainly about the offense here. Um, and some of the things we might have to worry about playing Oklahoma. So Oklahoma so far this season through three games, number one in FBS for completion percentage at 83% and third down conversion at 67%. That's going to be tough to match up with. It doesn't matter where you're playing, but how much weight do you put on who they're playing so far? Depends. Bearcats, on the other hand, are number 33 in completion rate, which actually is pretty good. That is a good jump from where we were last year. Um, and, and so I think that's one thing to look at as a positive. Um, and we are uh, 26th in third down conversion, which also, again, Bearcats offense moving into the top 30, a lot better than being in the 70s for almost everything last year. Um, we still have a lot of season to play left, but we'll get there. Um, as far as Oklahoma goes, number three scoring offense in the country at 55.7, basically 56 points per game. That's a lot of points. It doesn't matter who you're playing. If you can throw up a lot of points like that every single week, um, consistency is key there. Bearcats at number 30 with 39 points per game. Um, Oklahoma's first down offense, number five in the nation. Uh, Bearcats are 17th there. Technically ninth. There's a lot of ties in uh, specific numbers that go down the rates there, but um you know, I, I think there's some closeness, but it, clearly Oklahoma is still ahead in a lot of these. Um, as far as passing offense goes, Oklahoma is number seven in the nation compared to the Bearcats at number 29. Again, good to see the Bearcats up in the top 30 in anything offensive metrics wise. Um, but here is a really big thing, which, again, we've talked about a handful of times so far today. Um, red zone offense, Bearcats. Not great, um, as you can imagine. Number 73 in the nation um, probably would have been a lot higher if you convert even a few of the red zone attempts you had um, in the last game against Miami. Oklahoma, number four. Um, so basically, if they get downhill with a very, very good first down offense, a very, very good third down offense, and they get into the red zone, um, you better be praying you can hold them to a field goal. That's all I have to say about that. As far as a positive here, where the Bearcats look very good, we have said this so far this season, and this stat backs this up. The Bearcats are number eight in the nation compared to Oklahoma at number 50 uh, with 239 yards per game. That is a massive, massive improvement over the past few years uh, for the Bearcats, but specifically, uh, I think it's just part of Satterfield's system, and, and you can understand why, but to be top 10, in rushing, I think is huge. Um, and we've, you know, I, I think we've played some teams that we're used to playing. So being up there early is good. We'll see if they can keep it up. Um, and then the final one here is just on total defense. Uh, Oklahoma stacks up at number 32 and the Bearcats are number 44. So um, that, of course, there's a lot of variances in there. A lot of weight from different teams that you play. But, um, you know, I, I think defensively, these teams honestly should be looking for fairly similar, but offense can the Bearcats offense keep up and more specifically, can the Bearcats defense slow down a Oklahoma's offense who is very effective. And that I think is going to, you know, play a lot into how we see things go this week. Steve, what do you think uh, about some of that? Uh, seems like Oklahoma is good and we are <laughs> uh, maybe not as good. So <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. They, they they played like I said three G five teams. It's weird to say that now that we're part of the P five, but uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, they they played two American teams and a Sun Belt team. So maybe we'll see what they're like. And they for some optimism, Justin, they did start three and zero last year, and then they finished the year three and seven. So yeah, maybe there's some silver lining there. I don't know. I just think their talent is much better than ours, and I'm I'm just. <laughs> I, I might not be planted in front of the TV at 9 a.m. local time, Justin. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me just say that. But. Here's here's the last number for you today. FPI. Bearcats were climbing for quite some time. The Bearcats have now slipped back to number 37. Oklahoma, better than even the rankings put them at. Uh, they're number two total. So I think if... FPI is has anything to say about it. If you can pull off an upset against Oklahoma, that will carry a lot of weight 
you're not beating the number two team in the nation, but you are beating a very, very strong opponent. Yep, for sure. And I, I, I mean, hey, Nippert Magic shocked the world, maybe. I'm just trying to talk myself into this, Justin, <laughs> but I don't know. We'll see. I mean, we'll see. first time for the Sooners in Nippert, not at Paul Brown Stadium. Maybe they'll get a little uh, scared of the tight confines they also always have a stinker on the road so maybe their, their stinker will be there that's true this first one so could be i'm just Big trying to kick off let's see what happens i mean there's a lot going for the Bearcats this weekend um I, I think it's comeback week i think it's bounce back week dante corleone said it himself the man the myth the legend the godfather bounce back week so if you're not hyped up enough from listening to us trying to hype you up let them hype you up uh Get after it this week, guys. That's all. I, that's all we got to say. Hopefully, we can pull something off here. We're gonna win the tailgate. You know, that's yeah. what really matters. Twelve thousand Cincy lights in a, in one day. So you be, <laughs> you better believe that number's getting crushed this weekend. Speaking of crushing some numbers, Steve, we're gonna crush a minute here. You've got the Bearcat Sports wrap up. We have three and a half minutes left on our free Zoom. Hit us with it. Get us the Bearcat Sports wrap up, and let's get out of here. All right, here we go, baby. Men's golf. The Bearcats finished fourth in their own invitational this past weekend at Coldstream Country Club. Shout out to the guys. Women's golf heads to Lubbock for the Red, Red Raider Invitational on Monday and Tuesday. Red Raider Invitational in Lubbock, Texas. Cross country heads up to Minnesota to race in the Roy Griak Invitational this weekend, Friday. Uh, volleyball, they split matches this weekend, falling to Butler in five games before defeating Wright State. They host rivals UCF Thursday and Friday. Soccer, they drew at K-State last Thursday, and they will host TCU and Iowa State this weekend at Gettler Stadium. Get out there. Tennis, they won six doubles and eight singles matches this weekend at the Harvard Classic. And oh, faced off against Harvard and was faced off against Dayton this Friday. And hockey, they split a home and home against Dennison and will finish visit Adrian University for two games this upcoming weekend. Boom, that's a minute. Let's go. That's a minute. We finished it. We finished in a minute. Um, yeah. Get after it, folks. There's a lot of Bearcat sports happening this week through the weekend. Um, and, of course, the granddaddy of them all, Big Noon Kickoff. So let's hope that we can pull it off. Let's hope that we can get wins across the board for all of our beloved sports and Bearcats fans alike will be celebrating one way or another. So without further ado, thank you for listening this week. If you aren't already, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube. Make sure to subscribe and hit that follow button for Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to us. And make sure that you're checking out our Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts, all of those reels. There's way too many things nowadays. Um, but again, we are trying to consistently put out clips to give you guys little snippets of the show. If you can't catch us week in, week out, you can catch us on some of our social profiles there. So make sure to check those out. So again, thank you guys for listening this week. It's been a pleasure answering some questions for some of you guys. Hopefully we'll get more mailbag from you guys coming forward. Uh, we really do like answering some of those questions. So take it easy. Go Bearcats. Let's beat Oklahoma. Get it done. Bounce back week, baby. Beep. Look at